Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm super excited, obviously, to be chatting with Kaisa today. We've been already talking about a few different things, but Kaisa, um, do you want to just tell us a little bit about where you are and um, where you're calling in from today? Hi, yeah, I'm in Finland. I'm about an hour north from where I live at a university where I teach part time at the library because I really like books. So I, I thought this would be like the perfect place to do the interview. Awesome. Yeah. And so Kaisa, so you're, uh, you're a Finnish uh, bike adventurer and an award winning comic artist. You've uh, published a number of books and you've written thousands of miles, obviously through Alaska and through lots of other places. Um, and you also happen to have legs made out of carbon, as we can see there in the photo. They look pretty badass. Um, so you, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started in cycling? Well, originally I, I was a pretty normal Finnish kid in the sense that I'd cycled to school, like especially in the 80s when I you know, when I started first grade, it was kind of, it was an exception for anyone to to get a ride from their parents to school or to take the bus. Like cycling was kind of the thing that, that you do to go to school. So that was, it. like, I don't remember learning to ride a bike. It was just like such an ordinary thing. And, uh, and I never imagined it becoming like a big hobby or, or a passion the way it has. But, but over the years, I guess I always had a bike, but with my old feet, I wasn't able to ride that much. So it kind of, kind of was something that was more like in the background for, for a long time, but that I re rediscovered then when I got the prosthetics. Yeah, and so I can you tell us more about that? So you, you had a different set of legs growing up and that changed. You made some decisions and that changed. And um, what was that process like for you? I had like a pretty serious malformation in, in both of my feet. And, and the doctors had actually mentioned amputation when I was born, but it seemed so extreme to my parents at the time. And it was like, I was born in 78, so prosthetics back then were like actual wooden legs. So yeah, so I can kind of relate to that decision that they didn't want their little baby to have that. But when I was 23 years old, I chose myself uh, that I wanted to get amputated because my old feet were getting so painful and, and I had really limited a li really limited like range of movement in them I was barely able to walk and cycle at that point because I had like arthritis in my ankles that was super painful and was just gonna get worse and afterwards I you know looking back when I think about it myself I'm also sort of um, baffled by the fact that I was able to make that kind of a huge yeah. decision I, I wouldn't maybe say that I'm I'm the kind of a person who tends to you know leap into things or I'm more of even a bit of a pessimist so so I guess I just felt like I needed to do something and I the funny thing is that I, I read an article about a Paralympic athlete from the US who was competing like in a in short distance running and I couldn't really run anymore at that point and I was like I want what she's running on and, and I kind of took the article and went to visit a prostitution and asked if I could also you know like can you give me legs like that as well and and the prostitution kind of, kind of took me seriously right from the beginning and it was a bit of a I mean it's a bit of a long story but in the end the doctors also took me seriously and uh and I, I was in a wheelchair for a month and um, healed super nicely and, and was able to start learning to walk again. And the following summer, like just a few months basically after the amputation, I learned to ride a bike again. Six months after? I think it was even less than six months. I think it wow. might have been like four or five. 
Wow. That's... And I remember like the first time I was getting on a bike with the prosthetics and it felt super hard and awkward and my balance obviously was kind of all over the place. And But the biggest problem was that like I was trying to get on the bike, but the bike wouldn't move. Like it wouldn't budge. It was just like stuck. And I was like, what's going on? And like, why did I really like, you know, lose my ability to ride a bike? And then my partner, it was his bike. And uh, and he was like, maybe if you weren't like squeezing the brakes so hard. <laughs> oh my goodness. That must have been such a... It went pretty, it was pretty easy. Yeah, wow. I, I mean, there's so much about this story that is extraordinary. I mean, the, from making that decision when you were 23 to being the person, I didn't realize that you were the person that was like, I'm doing this. I just kind of assumed that maybe someone was meant, you know, suggested to you, but you did, you chose this, you went for it and, and it transformed your life. I guess doctors usually tend to be a little bit conservative in the sense that it's not something that they would necessarily recommend unless the person, you know, unless the person's life was threatened or, or whatever, they, you know, they don't want to upset people by proposing that they'll chop off their legs. But yeah, but it really, for me, like, I've, I've been doing this like meditation practice for a long time and uh, that that's sort of um, based on the Hindu tradition and I I had been reading all these books on yoga philosophy about how we're not these bodies and you know the body is just like a vehicle for the self and uh, and changing bodies you know reincarnation and all that and and that really helped me immensely because it, I guess in a way I was able to look at it like feet are just like, it's just like changing the tires of a car. Like I am me, like regardless of what, which material my feet are made of. And the carbon fiber is just matter the same way that, you know, bones and flesh would be but it doesn't change who I am in any way. I'm still the same person. And, and that I think, like, makes a really huge difference for me in, in being able to handle the whole transition. Right. And so, so right after your surgery, you were able to, um, did you start the meditation before surgery or afterwards? I had been, do, I had been doing it for several years already at that point. Never was super good at at having like a super steady daily practice but it was like always there kind of uh, in the background at least and and then there have been times when i've been doing it more intensely so so i really think that it it helped me having like that even like a theoretical idea you know philosophically of of me being something different than this body so it doesn't really what happens to the body isn't like the end of the world yeah people ask me like how does this affect your feminine identity and i was like the whole thought hadn't really crossed my mind you know like how could my identity change you know it's like i feel like the feet really i put them on in the morning like i put my pants on it's really just like a tool that i use to walk around but it doesn't change who i am Wow. And um, wow. And so, so you had this operation, you decided to make these changes, you started where, you know, incorporating this tool, these legs into your life. Um, you owned it, you owned your whole identity as the same person. Um, how did you start envisioning these, these long bike trips? What was, what was that like for you? The whole thing kind of, I have to admit, people see me as this like fearless adventurer. But yes, <laughs> we do. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we had bought a road bike some years before that. I guess we had a friend who had been like, who had been like a professional, like competitive cyclist. 
when he was younger. So we kind of knew that these fancy road bikes exist and they're super, you know, fast and nice to cycle. And, and so we had like that example of someone who would ride really long distances. And uh, so my partner got a road bike and he wanted to like go on a little tour just like I think it was like 50 miles from our hometown and I was like thinking of of all these like men who have hobbies and their wives are sitting at home like waiting for them for them to come home and even yeah. doing like small bike rides I had seen all these men on super fancy road bikes and, and then I had seen women like lugging like groceries and children because you still a lot of people are still doing that in Finland and and they had these really like horrible clunky heavy bikes and and I was like how come do all these guys get these awesome bikes and they get to go on these rides and where are their wives like are they waiting at home for them and I was like I'm not gonna be the wife you know who's yeah <laughs> I love this <laughs> and I'll be like waiting at home and I don't know, doing the dishes. So right. I was, he's going cycling. I'm going as well. Like if it's the last thing that I do. That's amazing. So on this like overnight trip, like just one night to, to like a, like a really sweet little village near us, and and it was fun. So my next thought was like, so next we go like on a two night trip. But my my partner, he's like like a megalomaniac like that so his idea was that we ride from our our home like in southern finland all the way to northern norway which is almost a thousand miles i think so that was his idea of the next step and i was wow. like <laughs> but there's no way i'm staying home i'm not the wife who stays at home so it was kind of like this stupid pride in a way huh. that got me into cycling but that trip like riding all the way through Finland to, to the Arctic Ocean that really for me was a life-changing experience like the way that I see myself changed entirely through that trip like being able to you know because we had never ridden our bikes for that like amount of time like on consecutive days and so we had no idea what was going to happen and even our friends were kind of like yeah you'll take the train back after three days and it really felt like you know my partner is not like athletic and he's more like an adventurer than than you know a person who'd been to sports and i'm obviously you know crippled so no one really believed that we could do it wow and we did and we were there like by the arctic ocean and we felt like if we could do this then we can really do anything yeah and i always thought you know like being like a person who likes to read i always thought that my like place in life is to sit at home and read about other people's adventures and then all of a sudden i'm the adventurer and that was just so cool and that's like an experience that i really wish that more people would be able to uh, that i'd really like to share and that's yeah. also that's why we started doing books about the bike trips because we wanted to inspire other people to to you know experience that yeah that is that's amazing and i i want to ask you more about your books um but before moving on from that bike trip i'm just curious like were there moments when you were biking you're like maybe it wasn't a good idea like was it or were you just the whole time you're like yes i'm going to the arctic ocean you know like like what was it like what on that first trip i remember um i was in fairly good shape but i didn't have a super great saddle i had like the saddle yeah. the bike and my butt hurt so bad that at some point I was just like wearing double cycling pants, you know, they're like padding. Yeah. It was yeah. so bad. And I remember like I was ready to give up, but I think we took like a day off 
somewhere and and that kind of yeah i think we took a day off like in a really boring small village and there was nothing to do and then the following morning i was like okay like whatever like let's just get back on the bikes and like that's the best way to get out of here and, yeah. uh, <laughs> wow that's lucky that it was such a boring village that's like <laughs> Right. <laughs> people are like don't you want to stop and like you know take it easy and and i'm like you know the places we've stayed at because we take like you know back roads and so on a lot of those places like like i don't want to be mean but but spending one night is enough like you've already seen that because there are a lot of these like you know, one horse towns, you really see them in one night. With one horse, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great, and you don't really, and you also get like the road kind of is calling you in a way, you get yeah. kind of this, yeah. I don't know, there's like this passion in you, like that right. pulling you forward. And right. those, those days off, I often feel like a little bit restless and weird, like from, the body gets used to cycling and then you want to keep going but yeah. yeah after that trip i got another saddle and then another one and i think this one's like the fourth saddle that i've tried out i have like the brooks like women's saddle with the hole in it uh, and it's the the vegan one that's like covered in uh organic cotton so okay. it's super weather resistant unlike the leather saddles that you have to like polish and and care yeah. this one's super like carefree and and, it, and super nice so i've the saddle issue has been resolved but that really was like yeah the first trip would have failed it would have been the saddle that caused i think it. that's yeah that's it's such a good point. I, I've also ridden on on saddles that didn't fit my body, and that can make or break your trip. And um, but you obviously rode through it and kept going, and and just totally owned that trip. That's that's amazing. Um, did you start writing your books before that trip, or or after that trip? So you mentioned you. Um, wrote about your cycling journeys. You've also written a number of other books. You do comics that are incorporated. Uh, can you tell us more about the art and how that relates? I started doing comics when I was studying graphic design, like uh, at the end of the 90s. And, and I first started doing like little zines and really like small stuff. And they've kind of grown over the years into these hardcover books and but very grown sort of really organically and i've done a ton of autobiographical stuff so i also did a book about getting amputated back in the day like a hospital diary but then i really felt like people like i didn't want to be sort of put in this box of being like a disabled artist talking about disability and I'm being like labeled like that. I wanted yeah. to, because I really think that in the art world, you have like the white male, you know, artist who's a, who's allowed to pick any theme they like. And then you have like minorities doing art and, and expected to kind of only focus on their like minority themes, right. which right. is changing now, like with the whole discussion on cultural appropriation and everything. But I really felt like, like I was being labeled as a disabled artist and I wanted to to sort of uh, rebel against that label. And, and that's one reason why I started doing books about the bike trips, because I figured that here was another theme. Because right. I was a little bit stuck. People really liked the book. I got a lot of attention for the book on getting amputated. It's obviously like a dramatic theme. Right. And I was like, how do I go forward? Like I can't like be chopping off more body parts and it, every time I want to do a book like I have to find yeah. it <laughs> that's not the way forward <laughs> not a sustainable method of right. <laughs> and so the bike trips luckily came along and yeah so we yeah 
so we kind of like the way we started out was that I would do the comics and my partner would do the design like the covers and stuff but over the years things have gotten more sort of mixed up so he also uh, partially writes them and and comes up with a lot of ideas for like book concepts and uh, and uh, but I mean officially I'm the artist and he's the designer and uh, so we've done like we did a big book on Hindu mythology inspired by the meditation practice and and that whole world and uh, but the travel books have really because travel has been like such a big passion for us by bike and by kayak that that those themes have have really dominated our books in the last I want to say 10 years or so yeah and so I know you brought a couple of your books with you can we see um, some of those characters and um, so you have these reoccurring characters in them can you can you show us those and can you speak a little bit about who those characters are yeah so I have like the doc and the mouse who go on adventures together and they're like our, our older egos they're a little bit more uh, feisty I want to say they're a little bit more open and um, self-confident and um, uh, but I've been working with these characters for many years now so they've kind of taken on a life of their own uh, I want to show you a page from our newest book so this is a paddling trip we did in Russia uh, two years ago we were paddling for seven weeks uh, from White Sea to the Baltic Sea to St. Petersburg and uh, yeah on day 29 I wasn't such a happy camper but this often happens I find like in the middle of a long trip that you get like really tired of the whole you know going through the whole process yeah. over and over again every single day having to find a find a campsite then figuring out like where to go and what to eat and the whole you know oh yeah <laughs> here's a but here was a really special super nice uh time we were invited to this party with these russian artisans who were all living in a village for the whole summer and selling their work to tourists and so these like cruise ships would come in every day and and these artisans would sell like jewelry and, and crafts to them. And then in the evening, the ships went away and the whole village kind of went quiet. But we happened to be staying there. Like we had just pulled up our kayaks and asked if we could stay for a couple of nights. And the uh, and what was really cool was that somehow the the artists didn't seem to see us as tourists at all but they they like invited us to their kind of secret party in the evening and Ooh. and their live music and dancing and singing and tea like in a samovar and it was super cool and and i find that that's something that i really like about bike travel or paddling which is really similar in many ways that people don't really look at you like as a as a tourist or or like as a stranger that you want to make money out of yeah. but often I find that they sort of feel like it's like a mix of pity and admiration you know because <laughs> you're going so far and you're so tired and at the same time you've gone so far and you've gotten so tired <laughs> yeah <laughs> here in the heat and how can I help them and and it's really like a wonderful way I feel of meeting people because we've traveled in places like like you know small town russia the sort of income gap between finland and russia in those like areas is huge uh, then you get like the big cities where you get people that have way more money than anyone in finland but but in those small villages you have these people kind of growing their own food and living like really simply in a way that very few people are living in Finland, but still they would somehow feel like like a connection to us, and we would feel a connection to them. 
you know, which is so different from traveling somewhere like going on a vacation in a city where all your interaction with other people is basically based on money. Right. You're, like, you're paying them for goods and services. And so you, they see you like as a client and you see them as service providers. And it's a totally different, you know, meeting between two people compared yeah. to like someone offering, you know, a tired cyclist a place to stay in their own home. Right. Yeah, that's part of part of the the magical quality of those trips, right? Is those connections that you make with people on the way that you would never meet before. And you you wrote at least one book about that, right? Um, about um, fear and kindness and uh, strangers. And I'm yeah. really yeah, I'm so curious about that book and. And what that means to you and how that kind of reflects both what you've learned on your journeys and also what you've brought onto these journeys. Yeah, yeah, that was also like, that was also a trip with it to Russia. And Finland and Russia obviously have like a troubled history in many ways, you know, because of the Second World War and, and them like occupying large areas of Finland that still remain a part of russia so the first time we went cycling there a lot of people were kind of like warning us about it the same thing actually also happened when we were going cycling in the u.s that people were warning us <laughs> yeah I, I, yeah <laughs> and we we thought a lot of the warnings were kind of silly having like having already gone on bike trips elsewhere and and knowing that that most people don't really like when you they see you all sweaty like with all your smelly gear like stuffed into your bags they don't really think of you they don't look at you and think that you have a lot of money necessarily yeah and and on that trip uh de describing that book that you mentioned place of death right. it's basically de just depicts one night in russia we were looking for a place to to stay like someone had told us there was a nice campsite but we couldn't find it and we were kind of exhausted and dehydrated and you know you get to that point where you can't really make a decision so yeah. you're like standing there and kind of like woozy and so we we had a friend with us she's been living in Finland she, since she was a child but but her first language is Russian so she went to ask uh, this local guy if it was okay for us to camp there for one night and the guy was like you don't want to go there that's the place of death and oh. we're like wow <laughs> like place like this is this is not great news but we were tired enough that we decided that you know place of death that's it's not it's not great <laughs> news but like <laughs> We'll check it out. <laughs> I said that, but he didn't see the camp there. <laughs> we took up the tents and, and it gets dark. It was the sun was already setting like when we got there. So it gets dark and we we had something to eat. We didn't have a lot of food with us. And there were so many mosquitoes and it was uh -huh. kind of it was not the nicest place to camp, I have to say. And then we hear like someone's walking like someone's walking towards us when we're like okay let's not panic someone's just on an evening walk you know and they're not they're not a murderer coming to kill us they're just, you know on the walk and the steps come closer and closer oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy talking and saying something in russian and we're like okay <laughs> that's it like it was a you know we had a great life but not <laughs> It was the same guy that our friend had talked with who had said that it's the place of death and he felt so sorry for us because he he said that he originally thought that we were like experienced travelers but now now he sees that we're just like a group of you know little children who don't really know what they're doing so he brought over like a tarp that we could put on our tent so oh. we wouldn't get rained on 
he brought a light like a headlight because he figured we were so like such like simple children we wouldn't have oh my gosh he brought a, uh, like a jar of jam like wow. whole, and now I was like you know all the like warnings like everything people had said about Russia and Russians and how how you know the police can't be trusted but the people who aren't police can't be trusted either no one can be trusted and what actually happens is this guy wants to bring us some jam so we can have that like with our evening tea yeah it was so that that moment to me kind of really is what what bike travel is all about and like that way of of meeting people like putting yourself in that position where you're so like pitiful really <laughs> that people will you know just yes. bring you up because they feel so sorry for you it's <laughs> you know, if we have this illusion of control when we're in the city kind of we we just had a storm here a few days ago and and if the electricity you know goes off people get super upset and how could this happen and why is the government not doing anything and people have this kind of illusion that we can control you know nature and the whole earth basically that it's ours to use you know to make use of and and, uh, and we can sort of uh have like this system that's indestructible but but that's not true at all we're actually so like vulnerable and and i think it's really healthy to you know be in the nature and really be like in these situations where where money doesn't even sort of play a role at all mm. we're just out there and and nature like you realize the forces of nature are so much bigger than than any of us really that's amazing yeah um so we are nearing uh the end of our interview time here so i just do want to recap a little bit about all of the amazing things that you talked about so far so we we went from um that big decision that you made when you were 23 to um to get a new pair of legs uh you uh, up my legs, really. <laughs> what's that to upgrade my legs That's an upgrade I'm yeah doing. an upgrade and and you ran with it you did your um really it sounds like a very profound meditation to get you through that of acceptance it sounds like and moving forward you started biking again um you let go of the brakes and moved yourself forward. Um, you started planning these big bike trips. You biked all the way up to the Arctic Circle. You've been creating these beautiful books um, with these really fascinating characters. Um, and you've kind of, it sounds like you've just been able to engage with people in this really, really meaningful way, which is just so beautiful to hear. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm leaving this like so inspired by you in, in so many ways. Um, and I guess I just wanted to ask in closing, um, so what are you working on now? Uh, are you working on another book now? Are you planning another trip now? And is there anything else that you want to share with us about um, your adventures or anything that we've, we've talked about so far? Yeah, I'm actually working on a book like on our, about our trip to Alaska. Last year we uh, we flew to Anchorage and and we rode in, in Alaska, like went up to Fairbanks and and um, took the old Denali Highway and and then we rode through Yukon and BC and and yeah. up, like west like along the west coast in the US and and we were sending postcards to a friend back home back here in Finland. Uh, we already did. A project kind of like that in 2016 when we rode from New York to San Francisco that we sent these postcards to Finland and and put them together into a book so this is kind of like an independent sequel type of a thing more postcards from travels but I've grown really fond of the format so I would have this kind of system that 
that I'd usually I'd do them in the morning or like at a lunch break about the previous day. So I, I had like had the night to kind of, you know, work through what happened the previous day. And, and it, it's a really nice way, I think, of um, working on a book that, because if you, if too much time has passed, you tend to sort of uh, impose mm-hmm. all kinds of ideas on the, on what happened during the trip. You tend yeah. to make yourself sound much smarter and more profound. As I stood by the yes. ocean, I realized the true meaning. <laughs> that. Actually, like when you, when you really stood there, like maybe you just were really looking for a place to pee because you <laughs> <laughs> water. And so I wanted to like capture some of those like genuine, you know, emotions that you go through on a, on a trip. So, so we have the postcards, US mail has been super reliable and out of, I think like 115 postcards, 108 made it back to Finland, which is so cool like, to think of how far those little pieces of paper have traveled from Alaska. Yeah. Like it's literally on the other side of the world yeah and so we're i've just been working on a map today and and there's gonna be a little booklet like with with a commentary sort of uh all the stories that didn't fit into the cards will be in the booklet then so i hope it'll be published sometime next year awesome yeah that sounds amazing and are you planning any new trips well we were the Pamir highway that's in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan but we didn't dare to go there this year because of COVID so hopefully next year we're also thinking of the Labrador Highway oh yes yeah yep You've... sorry I was up there uh, a couple of years ago yeah oh awesome we'll, we'll have to talk <laughs> that's one thing we really want to so we're really hoping that the whole COVID situation will kind of calm down by that there's going to be a vaccine next year or some kind of a solution so so we could because those are two trips that i really yeah really do. and uh, this year we went to northern norway and northern finland and we explored like the archipelago and and it's also i i mean it's been like a nice opportunity to to look more closely at things that are nearby because a lot of times we tend to you know want to go to exciting places far away yeah and like the really awesome stuff that's really close by so this summer we didn't fly anywhere and we we didn't like go abroad except for the baltic countries briefly but but we were kind of you know, have the opportunity to see things that are just like right in front of us that we've missed. But I have to say that I I really hope that we could do Labrador Highway next year. Yeah, that's a beautiful area. Um, I didn't quite, uh, yes, yeah, I did a route that was uh, very close there and we actually took uh, a slightly more southern route through to Kagaska. Um, but yes, that road is, I, it's still on my, my list of, it's just so beautiful and so remote and the bogs are just extraordinary. It's these like this, this climate zone that is nothing, it's like nothing I've ever seen before. It's so wild. So I hope you get to do it. I, I mean, that's a good one. Um, cool. So, uh, thank you so much for, for talking with us today for everything that you've shared, um, for everything that you continue to share in all of your books. Um, is there anything, um, oh, so is there anywhere that people should go to follow you or to connect with you more before we um, head into the um, question section? I'm really bad at updating my website. So I would say Instagram. Okay. Like I'm good at updating my Instagram. So it's just like Kaisa Leka, just my name, like, all of it spelled together so I'm easy to easy to find there perfect awesome Kaiser and Laura thank you so much for that that was like I I could listen to these for so long uh if people have questions that they want to ask directly to Kaiser or 
uh, Laura, leave them. But I guess I was curious, you know, so I do all the, the film stuff for Miles of Portraits. And I know as a creator, like I'm always saying, like, it, it's so wonderful that like, we get all the memories, but then when you actually create something, it's only like a small segment of that. And then people have their own reactions to it. And yeah. so I was wondering, um, Kaiser, what your experience of putting your work in the gallery uh, was like, and you know, how did you see people interacting with your own stories and work? Yeah, it's been super, I always really wanted to um, reach out to as many different people as possible. Uh, a lot of times, like in the comic scene, especially if you're doing like comics art or like alternative comics, you end up kind of, you know, preaching to the choir, kind of like sharing your art with like-minded people but the bike books like we've managed to find find a whole different audience like at the helsinki comics festival like the main comics event here we get these people kind of marching in like with their helmet like in their hand and, and clearly like looking for our table they spot the table they come over they're like where is the book about the american bike <laughs> That. and then they walk out so they're not like comics people at all mm -hmm. you know and i really like that that we're able to like lower the threshold for people to get into comics art you sometimes still hear people saying that they don't understand comics or they don't like read comics and to me that feels like if someone said that they don't understand movies and i'm like what kind of movies like have you really seen all the movies in the world like all the different but a lot of people still kind of have this idea of comics of, as being something really uh, light or really weird and artsy. And I find that we that I've been able to kind of reach out to a lot of people, sort of making use of the fact that people think that comics are just like fun, harmless stuff for kids. Uh, so they'll maybe grab a book where we talk about, you know, like disability and spirituality and like themes that you don't usually see in children's comics for sure. So they, you know, it's a whole new audience. And so in that way, I I really enjoyed like setting up um, exhibitions and going to events for children and abroad like to being like face to face to readers and getting like that instant feedback. Yeah. Even though sometimes they like pick up a book and be like, hmm, and put it down. <laughs> and I'm like, you didn't even give my baby a chance. <laughs> they, you know, just read a couple of pages even. But <laughs> you can't like, you can't. Yeah. I guess uh, one final question are there any is there a tip you might have for someone who is thinking about that that first trip um, in terms of like how to actually get out there or you know something you've learned over uh, over the miles well even though I had a horror story about a bad saddle i would say that like don't think about it too much and don't like wait for the perfect you know gear to come along or the perfect you know route or weather or whatever like just go like go tomorrow and don't think about it like right <laughs> we're going <laughs> i love that <laughs> sorry <laughs> you get these people like on message boards talking about stuff like like which you know pedal what do you call those like thingies that the pedal is attached to on the bike or which saddle holder is the lightest and this and that like like this sort of really nerdy like gear talk and and my sleeping bag you know weighs this and this much and and in the end, like the bike's gonna be heavy anyway. You're gonna have a lot of water and food on it. Like don't stress out about the kind of details that maybe make a difference if you're on Tour de France, but not on a bike trip, you know. It's gonna rain and it'll be messy and 
and your fancy gear will get you know dirty and smelly and and like just go like with any gear you have basically just go and you'll figure it out on the road and you'll figure out what works and doesn't work and then you can use your experience to plan the next trip but but i feel like a lot of people kind of get stuck at the planning stage and you know and it gets harder and harder to actually leave i love that i was just leaving in the comments where i kind of recklessly left on my trip across country i didn't know i actually had the granny gear the smallest cog that makes it very much easier to climb hills on uh bike touring trips <laughs> you know because i did so so few um practice runs but just like leaping into it and then there's so many people in the bike community that will help you along the way uh, which is always like a good reminder and so Kaiza and Laura, I think with that, we can thank you both for this time. Um, all of you, since you registered for the summit, all these interviews will be available online. Uh, today, the next talk is at two o'clock with Javier, who's going to be talking a bit about immigration, um, but he's also one of the first YouTube fans or fans of the Miles of Portraits YouTube uh, account that we actually got to meet in person. Uh, so I'm super excited for that. And um, Laura, I'll also pass it over to you since you did such a wonderful job interviewing. Where can people find uh, the work that you're doing? Yeah, so uh, I write a lot about my bike journeys at the Adventure Cycling Association website um, and blog. So that's at www.adventurecycling.org. And you can find me on Instagram at Laura Killingbeck on Instagram. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And we're also going to gather resources from all the speakers. So we'll make sure you guys have links to all the comic books, all the zines, all the creative work that you are doing, Kaiser. So thank you again for that. Thank you. It's been really fun. Well, thank you, Kaisa. Thank you so much. It's been so wonderful to chat with you. And I hope that we can stay in touch and talk about Labrador. <laughs> yeah, we should do that. <laughs> I was curious, where is Labrador? It's uh, uh, just north of you. Um, Labrador is, um, you, um, yeah, so it's like northeastern Canada. Good to know. Yeah. <laughs> Found a few. Beautiful. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. How do we say goodbye in uh, Finnish? Hey, hey. Mm. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Cool now. <laughs> I want to say goodbye. So, hey, hey. Hey, hey. <laughs>